Welcome to another program of U.S. Farm Report, brought to you by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. We have as our special guests Orrin Lee Staley, president of the National Farmers Organization, and Herb Goodman, grain commodity director of the NFO. Ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate the opportunity to visit with you again in your living rooms about the NFO. We firmly believe, as we have stated many times, that if the farmers correctly understood the progress that the NFO is making, the goals of the organization, that almost every farmer would immediately join the NFO. We believe that every rural businessman would immediately lend the support that they should behind the NFO. But today we're going to discuss several facets of the progress that the organization has been making. I have with me, of course, the director of our grain commodity department. But first, I would like to review some of the progress that our organization has been making. The reason I want to review this progress is because, particularly in the areas where we first started organizing NFO, many of the farmers wondered just what happened to the NFO after we first started organizing in the area, although our members have remained very active. And now they see those same members that first joined in the early phases of our collective bargaining organization. They see those members marketing their livestock, cattle and hogs together, uh, going usually to new, uh, new destinations, and of course coming home many times with a little more money. So many of the non-members are wondering just what gives here, just what is the reason. Well, there are several reasons. The first, of course, we had to organize over a large enough area that we could bargain industry-wide. And after we were over a large enough area, we had to make our bargaining power felt to the point that even the largest processors and many of the medium-sized processors would have to recognize the necessity of the doing business with NFO members in order to secure the necessary volume to meet their plant needs. Now, these same processors have realized uh, many times that farmers had the right to organize, but most of them doubted that farmers would ever organize to sell together and to bargain together. But now as the NFO has made its progress very evident, and the fact that we are, as NFO members, selling our production together, it means that many of the processors now are realizing that NFO and its members can perform many services in the meat industry that have not been performed previously. Therefore, NFO representatives go to the various processors in any given area, and they say to the meat processors, NFO members are going to market together. They want to market information as to which plant or plants appear to be in a position to offer the best marketing services. And so then the NFO representatives point out to the plant management that at this point the members need to know that the plant has adequate facilities. They need to know that the NFO members will be paid on true market value, in other words, for a quality product. They need to know that the plant will be competitive price-wise, and then, of course, other marketing factors that need to be discussed. After this information has been gathered, NFO members are then informed as to which plant or plants appear to be in a position to offer NFO members the best marketing service. And so then, consequently, NFO members have the opportunity to market together, to work out their problems together, and of course, always bargaining for the highest possible price, and at the same time, cutting uh, the co marketing cost to the lowest possible minimum, which means in most cases, more net dollars to NFO members. And this is the reason that farmers see NFO members marketing together, uh, going to new points of destination as far as marketing is concerned to their products. Now, we have been telling the general farming public for some months that the NFO has been the basic reason for the greater than expected price rise on hogs. And of course, uh, the same is largely true as far as cattle prices are concerned. But hog prices are much higher than anyone had predicted, anyone that I've ever read at least, because most of the predictors and the farm publications were saying that hogs would reach a price level of about $16 by sometime in April, $18 by mid-June or thereabouts, and they reach a peak of some $20 a hundredweight sometime in August. Of course, these predictions were being made back in February, first part of March, but we all know what happened to the hog price. Uh, this was brought about 
by many factors. But one of the major factors and the unknown factor in many people's minds is the fact that the NFO had put together meat marketing arrangements over such a large area, an area that covers uh, the agricultural producing area from the Pennsylvania line to the western areas of Kansas and Nebraska and from the Canadian border into Kentucky and Oklahoma on into Tennessee, Georgia, and some other outlying areas. Now this had a tremendous effect because as NFO members started marking it together to those plants which appeared at least to be in a position to offer the best marketing service, this meant that those plants became more efficient uh, and this is a, a good part of improving uh, marketing efficiency, but at the same time, NFO members were able to receive the highest possible dollar, and of course, the plants that were not willing to accept NFO members' production as such uh, found themselves out hunting through the country, scouring the country for supply. This brought new and keen competition into the market, and as one or several, in fact, buyers said to NFO representatives uh, that NFO should be given credit for at least four dollars of the price rise on hogs. And then, as the summer developed, we knew then that eventually some of the facts would have to come out. One of those that brought out the first facts was Mr. Gene Fratell of the Iowa State uh, University Extension Economist, who had this to say along in the latter part of August. The usual relationships between hog prices and market influences would indicate that hog prices should have been about $4 above a 1964 level in May and June. Instead, the gain was six to seven dollars, this economist had to say. And then he pointed out that you usually have several market influences. They've always been pretty accurate on these in the past. And then he said, again, calling on the usual relationships, he had this to say about the quarter hog, uh, fall quarter hog prices should average about 25% above the 1964 levels. This would indicate that interior prices for U.S. number one, three hogs, 200 to 240 pound butchers of a little over $20 in September, while well, we know that the price has been considerably above this. And the Kiplinger letter, which is one of the outstanding farm publications, the Kiplinger Agricultural Letter, published in Washington, many of the farmers read it, uh, most of the economists and businessmen associated directly or indirectly with agriculture study it very carefully. The August 27th issue, it had this to say, on hogs, there seems to be a mystery as to why they went so high. Normal tools of the economist trade indicate they should have gone up, but in major markets, they soared about $2 more than they should have. The National Farmers Organization, it says, may have been behind the sharp rise. Doubtless, it has made progress in certain areas with its market contracts with packers to regulate flow of hogs to market for predetermined prices. Some packers say NFO made the difference. They tell us privately. Perhaps so, it's difficult to get a clear-cut answer within the trade, but they said that they would study, dig, it, uh, dig deeper to find more facts on it. So many people now are the highest authority. Those that have studied markets throughout the year know that there had to be a marketing factor that was not apparent in their earlier predictions, and this had to be the NFO. So this is the reason that NFO members now are very happy that they're able to bargain together and sell together. And Herb, the reason we brought this out, of course, today is that uh, from this experience and from the experience we've had in our grain bargaining in the past, uh, this sort of serves somewhat as a parallel to what we're doing now in grain, that the grain program that is now underway and the grain program we're building on. I'd like to introduce to the audience uh, another one of our key uh, administrative personnel that we're very pr proud of because uh, the administrative personnel, all of them are farmers, uh, many of them have had uh, very high educational training, a uh, good educational background. Herb, I think we ought, you ought to tell a little about uh, yourself. Uh, I know you're a pretty modest sort of a follow, but nevertheless, I think you ought to tell a little about your background because I do think that it is uh, very important for people to understand that the NFO is bringing together a staff of people with varied backgrounds, all of them farmers, all of them working together to assist farmers in bargaining so that they may get a fair price for their products. Herb Goodman. Thank you, Arn Lee. Well, Arn, I uh, <clears throat> left the farm and went out to school after I was married. Graduated as a geological engineer from the Colorado School of Mines and worked for about 15 years for the Shell Oil Company as geologist. 
during which time I had some time in the service. But I was another one of those farm boys that seemingly couldn't stay away from the farm because in 1953, I resigned a very good job or position with Shell and moved back to the farm. I don't know how well that reflects on my judgment, but at least I think the farm is, certainly has many, many advantages as far as a way of life, a place to raise our most important crop, that is our children, and certainly agriculture is the foundation of the economy and the uh, food producing aspect or the part of our whole nation. Uh, the grain program, Warren Lee, in many ways, parallels the meat marketing arrangements, I think. Certainly at the time when uh, the grain is positioned and is available for sale, for selling to processors or uh, grain buyers, either domestic or foreign. At this point, then, I think our bargaining position becomes emphasized and, and uh, uh, pointed up because many farmers selling together and bargaining together just simply can't help but be more effective than those same farmers selling and trying to bargain individually. Well, Herb, I think this is so right. I think that any <clears throat> thinking farmer will understand and realize this. I think your background is so important because it shows that your real interest was in farming, and sometimes it's my observation, those people that uh, really, you might say, love farming, uh, that have had experience in other fields after they come back and find out how, how unfair farm prices are, they make That's the true. best fighters because they know what happens in other business. And right. so they're willing to help to adapt. Now, I think that on the grain program, uh, one thing that always seems odd to me is that I hear farmers talking, well, uh, soybeans just hit a certain price, or look what the price of corn is. The fact of the matter is they don't have any. They sold theirs at harvest times. So this doesn't do them uh, very much good. Uh, what do you think is the real key to uh, how do farmers establish their bargaining power on grain? Uh, what, what's, the basic, uh, what's the basic number one step? Well, the number one step, without a doubt, is to store and hold your grain at harvest because the very moment that you sell that grain, then you have lost your bargaining power as far as pricing or any of the other aspects of collective bargaining in agriculture are concerned. You have lost that at that point. You no longer have anything to sell. You no longer have anything to offer. And this is why it is so important for every NFO member and every farmer to store and hold his grain at harvest. It, it's, it seems utterly foolish that at the time that we are harvesting a year's work out here, that we turn around and sell that inside of a few moments at the same time when many other farmers are selling at that same time. In other words, a month to two months only, we see a year's production here be sold by the farmers who, uh, for one reason or another, do not store and hold their grain. Well, Herb, this is very important. Of course, we can not uh, advise the non-members what to do. Uh, no. All we can do is tell them what the NFO members are really doing, and of course, they have to become NFO members to go to the county meetings and get into the real discussion because on a 30-minute program, we can't go into all the details on bargaining, but this is the number one point. They have to, in other words, they, they not only hurt their own bargaining power, Herb, uh, uh, if they sell at harvest time, they hurt everyone else's too. Right. And so uh, this means that the mm -hmm. amount of grain that's stored at harvest time and kept in the ownership of the farmers in their hands is what their bargaining power. Now, I know that you gave a lot of thought when you uh, made the recommendations for our grain program. Uh, I think that you recognized that uh, one of the points was that the 
Grain farmers, like any other farmers, have to have income throughout the year. And therefore, uh, I believe one of the points was that after you said, okay, the first step is that you have to uh, keep ownership of this at harvest time, the, the next thing that you tried to devise was to build a method whereby they could sell as they wanted to, or practically so, a picture time of year, but at the same time build their bargaining power. Now, how, how can both of these be accomplished uh, with the same program, Herm? Well, we realize there are uh, times during the year when every, every member uh, has financial obligations of one sort or another that he needs to, to sell part of his production in order to meet these obligations. And for that reason, uh, we have designated four selling periods from harvest until through the total period of harvest through the following August the 15th. Uh, uh, we have made uh, surveys and have found out that there are certain times when more members wish to sell than, than uh, during a certain time than, than they would another time. And as a result, we have four selling periods, the first from harvest until January the 15th, the second from January 16th until March 15th. This is a two-month selling period. The third is also a two-month selling period from March 16th until May 15th. And the fourth selling period is three months, uh, covers three months from May 16th until August 15th. Now, it seems that all of us like to have a choice, Orrin Lee, any time that uh, we are uh, uh, faced with uh, working together. And in the case of our grain program, I think we've given the members a choice. We've given, given him a choice of when he wants to sell, what he wants to sell in the grain commodity line, and how much he wants to sell during each of those times. I think that this is, is an advantage. Well, Herb, I certainly agree with you, and I know that all thinking farmers would agree. Now, I think uh, you get into the point here, you've got a two-month or a three-month period of time. Uh, I know that oh, much of the thought was that uh, you wanted some flexibility so that uh, you bring this volume together, and it's conceivable that the grain trade uh, says, uh, well, we're not going to recognize farmers' right to sell together. Uh, so you had to keep some flexibility so you could go various ways, uh, as I know that uh, we can't hardly tell everybody uh, the, this part of the bargaining because uh, you have to keep flexible enough uh, so that you can go various ways. But I think it would be safe to say that uh, certainly uh, you always have, or almost always, uh, with any type of normal conditions, a general price rise from harvest time uh, on through, don't you, Herb? This, this is true. And then, of course, then with this general price rise, this means you're taking advantage of this for one thing. There is one point I'd like to mention right here, Orrin Lee, that many people erroneously think that the price of the individual commodity is uh, higher along in April or May or June than what it is at harvest time. But I like to think of it this way. If we would take a soybean here, that soybean has just so much oil in it and so much meal in it. In other words, the value of that uh, bean is established at harvest time. Now, why is it then that those beans are worth more normally along in June or July than what they are at harvest? Well, to most of us farmers, we think the beans are more valuable, but actually, Part of that increase in what we receive is from the storage, the interest on our investment, and the extra handling that goes into it. So uh, I would like for members to be able to differentiate between the value of a crop later on in the season. Uh, this includes many things besides just the, the grain itself. Well, now, uh, there is one other thing that I would uh, like to mention here. And that is that the, we have both a position in the elevator and a position in farm. Now, we, we speak about these positions. This means that this is setting aside 
physically, when you put the grain in the elevator, you have already hauled it in there, you have weighed it, it's been graded, and that grain is ready to be sold. So you have positioned it in the elevator. Uh, this is really the muscle of, I think, of our grain program. Now, because we don't want to penalize a farmer that has built on-farm storage, which I certainly think is very important, and uh, in order to take care of areas where there isn't physically enough elevator space available to handle this grain, we also have a farm position grain stored on the farm. And here the member will designate how much, how many bushels of a certain grain that he wants to sell in a certain period, and then he will have to deliver this grain within a 10-day period after this grain is sold, and he is notified through proper channels he will have 10 days then to deliver that. I might mention there is also an act of God clause in this grain sales agreement covering this so that due to adverse weather or road conditions that uh, this will be taken into consideration. Well, that makes sense, uh, Herb, and it shows a lot of thought has gone into the program. Now then, it seems only logical that any thinking farmer, knowing that if all the grain that is put in position could conceivably at least be sold over, well, we'll say, uh, what is there, about 600 uh, main grain-producing counties, yes. something of that way. This is right. Well, if you had, uh, well, it doesn't take very long. If you had 50,000 bushel of just corn, we'll say, or, or uh, 50,000 bushel of soybeans in each of, of these counties, it doesn't take long to get the 30, 40, 50 million bushel of grain together and to think of one sale uh, being made all at one time conceivably this way, it seems to me that anyone could realize that this is building the volume, and as the volume builds, the rest of the market gets starved, and That's this right. is to bound to create more competition in the market for the existing supply, but more important, as your volume continues to build period after period, uh, you can get so that you can be practically the only one with any volume source of supply, and I think it's important, Herb, uh, why is it, uh, uh, well, uh, I was just trying to think how to say it. Uh, our bylaws, of course, prohibit us from going into business, and I think this is fine, and this I is the too. reason that uh, we're not in competition with the existing businesses. Uh, then uh, tell the part, uh, then the, the, the local elevators will play, uh, as far as the grain program is concerned, those that are willing at least to cooperate uh, in handling NFO members' grains. Well, definitely we feel that uh, we as farmers out here need the services and the facilities of the elevators and we also feel that the elevators need the production that uh, uh, the farmer raises. So in our grain program we have uh, made the elevator, the local elevator, a part of this program because of the service that he does render us, and we think that it will be a mutual benefit on Lee because this is what he has set up to do, and it's, uh, we don't intend to uh, require the elevator to do anything that is not the normal uh, trade or normal practice with him. This, this we feel is very important if we are going to have the cooperation of these uh, agencies or these uh, facilities that we would like. Well, Herb, uh, the program then is based around first our county grain bargaining committees, the elected NFO members in their counties, go into the local elevators, see if they will uh, you have the storage facilities available here for to handle the in-position grain in the elevator or take care of it if it comes in off the farm. Now then, the next thing is, of course, that as these sales are made, it means that the farmers then will be paid, and of course they don't turn their warehouse receipt over, although they have to sign a sales agreement, so it's in order for somebody to have authority to sell. But surely undoubtedly they realize that nobody's going to sell less than the market price for the given day, and they're riding the normal price trend up. Uh, then I think it's important that they know that they do not have to turn the warehouse receipt over until the grain is sold. Uh, they keep that then until the grain is sold, and then when the grain is sold, then they get paid shortly after that on the this basis right. of the whole sale, the entire sale, isn't that right? This is sir? true. This is true. Actually, the, the time from the, the time uh, uh, limit, or not limit, but the time that elapses from the, 
from when they deliver the warehouse receipt until they're paid certainly shouldn't uh, be over three or four days and a week at the most. And then they're paid right there at the elevator. This is correct. <laughs> so they know before their grain then really leaves there that they have got the money for it. This is correct. And, of course, the important thing is that this sale should, because of volume, get a little more in price, uh, should save some marketing costs. But the important thing is that on the grain program, by these volume sales, that this is building their bargaining power to meet their problems. What grains are going to be included in these in-position sales, Herb? Well, actually, we're, start with? we're covering pretty much uh, the, all of the grains. Uh, we realize that some of those are... Uh, only of, you might say, local importance or in a relatively small area, but to those members in those areas, they are a very important grain. So right. we have some uh, 12 or 13 different uh, types of grain or classes of grain, for instance, several kinds of wheat and uh, the white and yellow corn, and this goes uh, right on down the line. But we wish to cover as many of the grains as we practically can. Well, they'll have to contact their local county NFO grain bargaining committees to get the details, this of course, true. as to where the elevators uh, are located that are participating in the uh, in-position sales or taking care of the in-position sales as far as NFO is concerned. Now, I think that it might be important, Herb, to touch on the fact that uh, just, just how important is it for farmers to establish their bargaining power? Well... The success of any program, such as our grain program or our meat marketing arrangements or any program of a similar nature that way, is entirely dependent upon the cooperation and the participation of the members. We are only going to get out of as much of this program as much as we put into it. And this is why it is so very important that uh, the uh, members attend their county meetings, their regular county monthly meetings, in order to keep abreast of what is taking place not only in the grain commodity department, but in the meat and the dairy commodity departments as well only. Well, Herb, I think that you were able to give some hints in the, to the NFO members about some of the problems that were to be expected at harvest time. Only NFO members knew about these problems, uh, and I think this is very important. We hear almost everyone talking about farmers need bargaining power. I wonder what those people that say farmers need bargaining power really mean. Simply, they must mean for farmers to establish bargaining power, they must work together. Collective bargaining in agriculture means farmers bargaining together and selling together. That's all collective bargaining means. And so, this is the opportunity now. NFO has the program, the structure, the scope, and the experience to successfully now conclude its collective bargaining program that will help farmers producing all commodities. All they have to do is take advantage of. The historic records of the United States government prove conclusively that farm prices must be in balance with wages and interest costs in order to have a fully operating economy and relative full employment for our nation's people. Government records also prove that each dollar of gross farm income generates seven dollars of national income. How much longer can we afford to underpay our nation's farmers when it is costing our nation seven dollars for each dollar of underpayment to our American farmers? The members of the National Farmers Organization are calling on the rest of the American farmers to join with them in an all-out effort to solve this farm problem. Join now.